Thank you, yes. Um, you know, we often talk about the uh, September 57 integration of Little Rock Central High, as we should, and the September 58 formation of the Women's Emergency Committee uh, with the lost year, as we should, but sometimes, much like the graduation of Ernest Green, sometimes gets left out of discussions in May of 58, um, the uh, recall election in May of 59, which ultimately uh, helps foster the reopening of the schools, uh, sometimes gets overlooked. And so that's what our focus is, is today. Uh, and I've entitled this, Remember the Recall. Um, at the September 2017 dedication of a sculpture commemorating the 60th anniversary of the integration of Little Rock Central High, City Director Dean Compuris reflected on his earliest memory of civic engagement. It was in May 1959 as a schoolboy wearing a button with STOP on it. The letters stood for Stop This Outrageous Purge and were in response to actions taken by three members of the Little Rock School Board. He recalled that as a young child he was not really sure what it meant. He just knew his parents supported Stop and that they and their friends involved in it were working to do the right thing. Dean Compuris was not alone. The STOP campaign was likely the first civic engagement activities for not only many school children from elementary age through high school, but also for scores of men and women who had never been involved in politics before. While the roots of the events go back decades and centuries for creating a nice parallelism, I'll just go with the direct roots for this, go to the May, uh, for the May 1959 recall election, go to the uh, May 1954 Supreme Court ruling in Brown v. Board of Education holding that public schools could not be separate but equal and must be integrated. The following May, the Brown v. Board 2 decision, the court focused on implementation and noted that it should be done with, in that now famous phrase, all deliberate speed. As we know, it was those decisions that led to the integration of Central High by the Little Rock Nine in September of 57 and the chaotic school year that followed. In September 1958, the Supreme Court was called in on to weigh in again, this time in an extraordinary hearing that took place before the start of their term on the first Monday in October, and this time the case originated in Little Rock. The genesis for this case, known as Cooper v. Aaron, was that the Little Rock School Board was seeking a delay in further implementation of the plan to integrate schools. Without going into all the legal maneuvers, which could take all day, here's a pricey. After the turmoil of the 57-58 school year, the school board was reluctant to have another year of integration, even if that integration was severely limited in scope. They caved to political pressure and filed a request for a two and a half year delay in implementing desegregation. Federal District Court granted the request, but the Court of Appeals reversed it. Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren called a special term of the nine Solons to consider the case. The stage was set. The hearing was held on September 11, 1958. The next day, it was expected the Supreme Court's decision would come, but probably no one could have foreseen all that would transpire on that Friday, September 12th. It was a day of much confusion in Little Rock. That day, in Cooper v. Aaron, the court found that the federal judiciary is supreme in the exposition of the law of the Constitution, and state officials must adhere to the court's decisions and follow the rules laid down in those decisions in similar future cases. And this decision, which is now viewed as a landmark in asserting federal primacy over state laws, the Warren Court made it clear that resistance to Brown would not be tolerated. They went on to state that interpretation of the 14th Amendment enunciated by the court in the Brown case is the supreme law of the land. Following this decision, the school board, the Little Rock School Board, issued a statement that indeed schools would open as planned on Monday, September 15th. That plan was for limited integration at the high school level. However, one of the school board members, Henry Rath, resigned his position on the board that day. He was frustrated the school board was caught between the Scylla and Charybdis of conflicting federal and state law. Later that same September 12th afternoon, Governor Faubus cited several bills into law which had been passed in a recent special session of the General Assembly. These bills were designed to make it more difficult to integrate public schools. One of the bills gave the governor the authority to temporarily close schools to keep them segregated. The law prescribed the governor would then call a special election for the voters in that district to decide whether to remain closed or be opened and integrated. One of the other laws laid out plans for recall of school board members. Shortly after signing the law which gave him the authority to close the schools, he did just that. He announced that contrary to the school board's earlier statement, Little Rock's four public high schools would not open on Monday, September 15th. 
He said October 7th is the date for the special election about keeping the high schools closed. Because elementary and junior highs were not set to be integrated, they were not affected. That night, high school football took place as planned. Central came from behind to defeat West Monroe, Louisiana. Hall had defeated Catholic High the night before. Both the Gazette and Democrat devoted many column inches to these two games in the sports pages. At the same time, many, the, the news pages had stories about the case and the school closure. Unsurprisingly, the newspapers did not cover the African American school games very often, so there, were, there was no mention in them as to whether Horace Mann had a football game that weekend. The fourth high school, Metropolitan Votech, did not have a football team. That Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, there were many conversations as people were trying to figure out what to do about the closed schools. One meeting that took place was at the home of Adolphine Fletcher Terry. She had invited a few friends over to discuss what role the women of the city could play in solving this crisis. This group decided to invite other women to meet with them on the following Tuesday, September 16th, at Terry's house. It would eventually grow to have over 1,300 members and have the name Women's Emergency Committee to open our schools, often just referred to as the WEC. The governor's closing of the schools that day, however, changed the WEC's focus from a more abstract contemplation to a concrete call of action. The WEC went to work to try to get the voters to reject the school closure. They wrote letters, made phone calls, offered personal pleas, raised money, and placed newspaper ads. Originally scheduled for Tuesday, October 7th, Faubus moved the election date earlier to September 27th. Speculation about the reason for the new date, new date has focused on him wanting it to be prior to the October 1 poll tax deadline so that only people who had paid their poll tax for the prior year were eligible. The thought was he did not want a rush of people paying their poll tax on September 30th only so they could vote a few days later to reopen the schools. The election was moved to a Saturday. Though Tuesday was the most common day for elections, in the 1950s, Saturdays were also used for elections. School board elections, for instance, were on Saturdays. An added distraction was that on the new election date, the Razorbacks were playing Tulsa in the first Fayetteville home football game of the season. These were all designed to stifle voter turnout. In addition, the state law required a majority of eligible voters to approve reopening the schools. The law also spelled out the very confusing wording of the ballot question. As historian Dr. Sondra Gordy has pointed out in her book, Finding the Lost Year, the ballot question was about being for or against integration of the schools. It did not say anything about closure or opening of schools. These rules collectively made it nearly impossible to vote to keep the schools open. Now, there was confusion as to whether football at the schools would continue after September 12th. The school board said closed schools meant no extracurricular activities. At a time that high school football was a major event in Little Rock, Faubus did not want to run the risk of anything that might push people to vote to open the schools. So he assured people that he had not intended for closed schools to cancel football games. After some back and forth, the school board reinstated football, band, and glee club. While the newly formed WEC did put forth efforts to educate voters about the issue and encourage a vote to reopen the schools, this nascent group was less than a fortnight old by the Saturday election day. On the other side, in addition to established groups like the Capital Citizens Council and the Central High Mothers League, the governor was campaigning for maintaining the closure of the schools in speeches, interviews, and TV appearances. On that Saturday, Little Rock voters cast 19,470 ballots to keep the schools segregated and 7,561 votes to integrate them. The WEC was d disappointed but remained even more determined. And as some of the members have, have subsequently commented, having over 7,000 people with them was encouraging. It would be a long road ahead to reopen the schools and there would be future elections. The regularly scheduled Little Rock School Board election of 1958 took place on Saturday, December 6th, while other Arkansas school boards that day generally had just two regular positions on the ballot, Little Rock had a unique situation with all six seats open. You see, in November, five of the members of the school board had resigned out of frustration, being caught between federal court orders and state laws forbidding them to integrate. The one remaining member was leaving office in December because it was Dr. Dale Alford who had unseated incumbent Brooks Hayes in the general election by running as a write-in candidate for Congress on a segregationist platform. Granger Williams of the Chamber of Commerce worked with Adolphine Fletcher Terry to recruit candidates to run for the six seats. They sought people who would work to reopen the schools. The five who had resigned had done it two days before the filing deadline, so this group had to work fast. 
The business civic slate was filed for the six seats were Ted Lamb, Billy Rector, Everett Tucker, Russell Matson, Margaret Stevens, and Ed McKinley. The latter was seeking Alford's seat and would be the only candidate who would be unopposed. There were a total of 13 candidates who filed for the six seats. On November 30th, the Pro-Segregationist Capital Citizens Council, or CCC, endorsed McKinley, along with Pauline Woodson, Ben Rowland Sr., Margaret Morrison, C.C. Rayleigh, and Robert Laster. An offshoot of the CCC, the States' Rights Council, offered its own endorsements, including George Branscombe, who had once been a CCC officer. In what the Gazette called Little Rock's strangest school board election, voters chose Laster, McKinley, and Rowland from the CCC list and Lamb, Tucker, and Madsen from the business civic list. At this point in time, school board elections were citywide. The latter three had been labeled derogatorily by Faubist as integrationists. Many of the races were close. Losing candidates on both sides of the issue challenged results. Uh, Mrs. Stevens, for instance, lost to Laster by 81 votes. Billy Rector paid for her race and his race to be recounted. The recount took two days, but the results stood. There were approximately 42,500 voters in the district. The election drew 14,300 to the polls, which was double the usual number. Though disappointed that only three of their candidates had won, members of the WEC and their allies took comfort in the fact they had elected three moderates to the school board. An evenly divided school board was set to take office later that December, but the odd elections during that school year involving the school district were not over. As the school year wore on and high schools remained closed, a new stasis developed. High school teachers reported to empty classrooms. Those who should have been their students went to other schools, took correspondence courses, or had no educational opportunities. And the Little Rock School Board remained evenly divided. It was beginning to look like the stalemate could continue forever. But in early May, a match was struck that lit the tinderbox that was the lost year. On Tuesday, May 5, 1959, the deeply divided Little Rock School Board met to consider employment contracts for the coming year. The topic had been on the April agenda, but with two of the six members out of town, it had been delayed. The school board meeting began at 9 a.m. in a room packed with spectators, and it was also carried live on the radio. There had been rumblings that the pro-segregation school board members were going to try to fire any teachers they viewed as integrationists. Every vote that morning ended with a 3-3 tie. After lunch, Tucker, Matson, and Lamb decided to leave the meeting. They saw no way to break the stalemate, and the attorneys had, had told them if they left, it would end the meeting because of lack of a quorum. School board president McKinley, however, declared the remaining members a quorum, and the trio spent the rest of the afternoon alternating between opening, opened and closed sessions, and at the end of the day, they had fired 44 school district employees, 39 whites, five African Americans, 27 worked at Central, and the other 17 were scattered at other schools. Seven principals, 34 teachers, and three secretaries. At the same day-long meeting, they fired Superintendent Terrell Powell, who had been named uh, superintendent in December after having been Hall High's first principal. Uh, the previous school board in its last meeting had uh, released Virgil Blossom from his contract and had appointed Powell. So on this same day in May of 59, Powell was replaced by Tom Alford, former Jacksonville school superintendent and the father of Dr. Dale Alford. During a portion of the school board meeting, um, which at that time the school district's offices were at 8th and Louisiana, a phone calls were being made to a house just a few blocks away. That house was the home of Mrs. Terry, who was hosting an executive board meeting of the WEC, completely coincidental that day. Not once to shy away, the WEC executive board voted to condemn the firings and support the teachers. Over the next few days, the Parent Teacher Association of Little Rock, the Arkansas Education Association, the League of Women Voters, and the Little Rock Ministerial Alliance all joined in the call condemning the action, and leadership of the Little Rock Chamber of Commerce also joined, joined in decrying the purge. And the fallout was just beginning. The evening of May 5th, at a ceremony to dedicate Williams Elementary, school board member Everett Tucker spoke against the, the teacher purge. His remarks were greeted enthusiastically by the patrons of the school. The next day, approximately 400 district patrons filled the auditorium at Forest Heights Junior High for a meeting. They too expressed their opposition to the firing of the district employees. May 7, 1959, the new Bale Elementary School was dedicated. School board president McKinley, who had been one of the three who had fired the 44, was scheduled to speak at the ceremony. As he was starting his remarks, some patrons stood and challenged him. Next, approximately 75 of them got up and walked out. 
McKinley then used his speech to defend his actions and to attack his opponents. His remarks were so strident that fellow school board member Laster called a press conference to distance himself from McKinley, but he also used that opportunity to criticize Tucker, Lamb, and Matson for what he turned as the politicization of the Williams Elementary event. After his comment, the remaining member, Ben Rowland, expressed support for McKinley, and he further stated that McKinley, he, and Laster had indeed previously discussed what would be said at Bale Elementary. With the school board in turmoil, teachers uncertain as to the legality of their contracts or the non-renewal of them, and civic organizations largely calling for the reversal of the firing, it's safe to say chaos reigns supreme in the Little Rock educational scene. Using this new law passed by the General Assembly, there was talk about recalling the need to recall school board members. The law had been envisioned as a way to recall those in favor of integration, but now both sides were looking into using it. But who would take the lead on this? Following the success of meetings at Forest Park Elementary and the Chamber of Commerce, as well as other school, PTA, and civic meetings, various independent efforts were underway to recall the three segregationist school board members. On May 7, 1959, just a couple of blocks from here, at Breyer's Restaurant on Markham, just west of Main Street, a group of young civic leaders gathered as they often did. This time their conversation focused on how to capitalize on the momentum mounting and the desire to recall the three segregationist school board members. Attorneys Edward Lester, Robert Schultz, and Maurice Mitchell were present, as was Gene Fretz, an Arkansas Gazette editor. It was he who came up with the acronym STOP, Stop This Outrageous Purge. That afternoon, the group reconvened at the Grady Manning Hotel, this time joined by esteemed attorney Will Mitchell. Among the other men who were instrumental in getting stop started were attorneys Henry Woods and W.P. Hamilton, as well as banker B. Finley Vinson. As chair of the Chamber of Commerce, Granger Williams had been a very vocal supporter about the efforts to reopen the school, and he, the schools, and his leadership was instrumental in the Chamber's quick and vocal support for the fired personnel. Dr. Drew Agar was chosen to be the chair of stop. The father of three children at Forest Park Elementary, he was vice president of the Forest Park PTA. It was he who had presided over the school's PTA meeting, which saw several hundred parents oppose the firing and endorse the recall of the segregationist members. Now, he had to use some fancy footwork to get the items added to the agenda at the last minute, but with creative parliamentary maneuvering, he succeeded. On May 8, 1959, Stop was publicly announced. The event took place at the Union National Bank, then located at 4th and Louisiana Streets. There were 179 people, almost all men, in attendance. Those presents were asked to contribute or solicit $100. In time, approximately $36,000 would be raised, which is the equivalent of $315,000 today. Other stop leaders included Maurice Mitchell as finance chair and Will Mitchell as campaign chair. On May 9th, the stop office opened in room 1010 of the Pyramid Life Building. It was open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. to accept donations and to receive petitions. At the stop meeting, standing ovations were given to R.A. Lyle, a former school board member and one of those who had resigned in November out of frustration, as well as the, the current members Tucker, Lamb, and Matson. And let's think, this is back in the day when standing ovation ovations were few and far between. Not at the drop of the hat, which they are now, but that's another story. Because most of the stop members were younger and junior level business executives, the leadership of Will Mitchell was crucial in not only giving sage advice, but in adding gravitas to the effort. In the coming weeks, stop would work closely with the Women's Emergency Committee. Throughout the year, the WEC had studied voter registration lists. They would put this skill to use as potential voters were identified as saints, sinners, or savables. The two groups worked hand in hand behind the scenes, but they had their work cut out for them. On May 15, 1959, the Pulaski County Election Commission met to discuss the competing efforts to recall members. The day prior, the Pulaski County Clerk had certified that petitions had enough valid signatures to have an election recalling all six of the members. The threshold had been 6,100 signatures, STOP had filed 9,600, and the opponents had filed 7,600. Because all the school board members were to be on the ballot, the election body decided to list them alphabetically, and for each man there would be a question as to whether he should be recalled and the voters would indicate yes or no. Monday, May 25th was set for the election. Voting would be open to anyone with a valid 1958 poll tax receipt. You must live within the district boundaries, which were not coterminous with the city limits. Unlike today, the Little Rock School District extended beyond the city limits, whereas now the reverse is the case. 
Voters must have been residents of Arkansas for a year by the election day, residents of Pulaski County for six months, and resided within their precinct for 30 days. Meanwhile, supporters on both sides were hard at work. STOP had been in existence for a week to promote the efforts to recall the segregationists. The Central High Mothers League and Capital Citizens Council, both established organizations, had been working to recall the other three members. But rumors were swirling that about the emergence of a new organization that was, which sought to fight in favor of segregation. And on May 16th, that new organization emerged. The Committee to Retain Our Segregated Schools, or CROSS, was launched by Reverend M. L. Moser, Jr., the pastor of Central Baptist Church. The three leading segregationist groups in Little Rock disavowed any connection to it. They all said he wasn't affiliated with them. Approximately 300 people attended the, the cross kickoff event. Joining Reverend Moser as a speaker was school board president McKinley with both Roland and Laster in attendance. It was originally announced that Reverend Res Wesley A. Swift, a radical segregationist from California, would be headlining the event, but at the last minute he canceled and no explanation was given. The cross offices would be at 108 Scott Street. While Stop was advocating the renewal of McKinley, Rowland, and Laster, Cross was out to recall Tucker, Lamb, and Matson. The final nine days were going to be intense. While the WEC membership would be a closely guarded secret for several decades, the names of Stop members were published in the paper after the launch. Opponents circulated flyers publishing the names, professions, and places of employment of the Stop members in an effort to encourage boycotts. It is certain there were members who lost business, but the tactic about driving them out of work did not succeed. In fact, some of those businesses are still in existence 60 years later, and those which aren't did not succumb because of Cross. But it must be noted that STOP members stood publicly in the face of economic uncertainty, and if the effort had failed, there was no telling how long the situation could have drug on. While many of them were fathers of school-aged children and still building their careers, or facing paying for college of those offsprings, this must have weighed heavily on them, and the same tactic of tactic of encouraging boycotts hit some of the same men a few years later when they worked to integrate downtown Little Rock. On May 19th, Stop hosted a rally for Little Rock teachers in the music hall of Robinson Auditorium. There were 300 teachers seated on the stage and 2,000 attendees in the audience. In an effort to create division, some Stop opponents had sent fake invitations to African Americans to attend the event. The plan had been to visibly show that Stop supporters were truly integrationists which was apparently one of the worst insults you could throw at someone in the 1950s. Also, depending on the seating plan, attendance by African Americans could have uh, violated Robinson's segregated seating policy. In response, stop leaders stressed they were for following the rules of Robinson and had not been behind the invitations. Their desire to not be viewed as actively promoting integration was much the same thought process that led to the WEC to maintain a whites-only membership. But the tactic must also have shown Stop that their opponents were worried about the potential outcome. May 23, 1959 was a Saturday and two days before the election. It was the last full day for door knocking as supporters for both sides were busy trying to get out the vote. Quite a few high school students who were called Junior Stop but had nicknamed themselves Backstop were involved in canvassing door to door, especially on this last weekend. Both sides were confident in a victory. Before a crowd of 1,000 in MacArthur Park that Saturday, segregationist representative Dale Alford and Mississippi Congressman John Bell Williams berated the Arkansas Gazette and its editor Harry Ashmore. Stop leadership predicted it would be the largest turnout in Little Rock school election history. They also stated that a TV appearance by Faubus in which he criticized Stop had actually pushed people over to their side. Echoing Stop, the Pulaski County Election Commission predicted 30,000 of the district's 42,000 registered voters would cast ballots. The previous record of 27,000 had been set in the, September 20, in the September 1958 election to keep the schools closed. By contrast, 14,300 had voted in the December election, which had selected these six school board members now on the ballot. On May 22nd, the final day of absentee ballot voting, 205 absentee votes were cast, bringing it to a total of 455 absentee ballots. Will Mitchell, in addition to being a renowned attorney, apparently had a wicked sense of humor. He used Cross's name against themselves in ads placed throughout, like almost on every page in the newspaper, which urged voters to cross out the names of the, on the paper ballots of the three candidates backed by Cross. Sunday, May 24th was election eve. As a Sunday, the election figured into some morning sermons. Reverend Moser spoke from his pulpit and described the issue of segregation as biblical. 
as many had before him and would after him. He used the story of Noah's three sons as a way to justify segregation. Supposedly one of the sons was the father of the white race, one the father of the African American white race, and one the father of the Asian race. In this narrative, no explanation is given for other variations such as Native Americans or other indigenous peoples, people from the subcontinent in India, also excluded as the likely actual race of everyone involved in the story, those who live in the Middle East. At Trinity Episcopal Cathedral, Dean Charles Higgins prayed for the schools but explained he would not tell parishioners how to vote. Reverend Aubrey G. Walton at First Methodist Church spoke about the schools needing to be free from politics and pressure groups. He did later appear that evening on a stop-sponsored TV program. The final campaign day embattled school board president McKinley refused requests from the media and others to divulge his secret plans for the future of the school district. Earlier he had stated he had an idea on how the schools could be reopened and be segregated but still be court compliant. Across the river, segregationists were planning a rally in North Little Rock to head off any plans for future integration on the north side. Congressman Alford had gladly already agreed to speak at that rally. In pay time on TV on this Sunday, Governor Faubus spoke at length in a criticism of the Gazette. He described the fire district employees as pawns in a larger game. That is probably one of the few statements Faubus made with which stop leadership would agree. Those employees had been used as pawns, just not by those that Faubus was accusing. Likely tired after a heated two-week campaign, Faubus did note in his remarks that he did not expect to sway any voters by that point. Not to be outdone, Stop was on all three TV stations numerous times that evening. Sometimes the same program was aired on more than one station simultaneously. In an appearance sponsored by Stop, Will Mitchell noted that May 24th was coincidentally Children's Day. He further stated that never before in Little Rock history had so many people volunteered for a cause as those who had worked on and with Stop. The WEC, PTA Council, labor unions, and numerous other organizations, which often did not work together, had come together to raise money, knock on doors, and otherwise get the words out, word out. Finally, it was all over but the voting. 19 days of outrage, exasperation, and hyperbole was coming to an end. When dawn broke, it would be election day. Now, May 25th was not just election day. It was also the last day of classes for the district's elementary and junior high students. The results of that day's vote would determine whether ninth graders would be class in class again come fall or whether they would be joining their older friends and neighbors and sitting out a school year. While expectations for a new record of voter turnout would not be met, over 25,000 registered voters did cast ballots on that election. As the precinct results started coming in, some unexpected trends developed. Some of the boxes in the more affluent western neighborhoods, which had been expected to be strongly in favor of keeping Tucker, Matson, and Lamb, were not providing the anticipated overwhelming numbers. Likewise, some of the more working class neighborhoods, which had been projected to be strongly in favor of keeping McKinley, Rowland, and Laster, were appearing more receptive to keeping Tucker, Matson, and Lamb than expected. Now, these class divisions, which had been an undercurrent in opposition since it was announced in 1957 Central High would be integrated, were continuing. A cross newspaper ad even went so far as to break down the races of the voter, voters in each of the city's five wards to point out that there were very few African Americans who lived in the more affluent zones, areas zoned for Hall High. As the night rolled onward, only Everett Tucker looked like a sure thing to be retained by the school board. At one point in the evening, it looked like the other five members would all be recalled. By, that by the time they were down to four boxes still uncounted, the three cross-backed candidates were guaranteed to be recalled, but the status of Lamb and Matson was still undetermined. Finally, with only two boxes remaining, there was sufficient cushion to guarantee Matson and Lamb would continue as school board members. Now, a bucket brigade of junior stop members was relaying results from the stop headquarters in the Pyramid Building to the watch party at the Hotel Marion a few blocks away. A young lady took the results from the stop offices down the elevator to a young man waiting in the lobby. He and nine other men formed a relay, with each running the results a portion of the route before handing them to the next person. One of the young men said that the young lady had the best job because she could actually read the results on the elevator down because the guys that were running had to pay attention to the route they were running, so they really weren't sure how the evening was going. Two boxes from Woodruff School were uncounted by the end of Monday. They had 611 votes between them, but that was not enough to change any outcomes. They were, however, kept under lock and key to ensure there was no tampering. Once it became apparent that Tucker, Lamb, and Matson were all retained and the other three were all recalled, the stop watch party erupted. 
Six young men hoisted the triumphant three on their shoulders and paraded them through the crowd. Dr. Agar enthusiastically announced the crowd, mission completely accomplished. At around 11 p.m., Will Mitchell addressed the crowd. He said, this is a great awakening of our hometown. I have never seen such a wonderful demonstration of community spirit. He then proceeded to thank the thousands of people who had volunteered on the effort. At the Cross headquarters, almost across the street from the Hotel Marion, McKinley and Reverend Moser were sequestered in a room poring over the results. As the night wore on, those Cross volunteers not in the inner sanctum with McKinley and Moser grew weary and contentious, not only with the media present, but with each other. Back at the stop party, the celebration continued. While people knew much work was still ahead, the men and women in attendance were enjoying a rare moment of joy after nearly two years of strife. In the days after the election, neither Congressman Alford nor Governor Faubus were circumspect. They both asserted they did not view the results of the election as a harbinger of changing views in the electorate. And they may have been right, considering the electoral success Faubus would continue to have, even in Pulaski County. Had Alford's seat not been lost to redistricting, causing him to decline to run against the powerful Wilbur Mills, he too might have been reelected repeatedly. The day after the recall election, there was still uncertainty. Now, it wasn't about the results. The doubt stemmed from the process. The school board recall law, which had been hastily passed by the General Assembly to be used as a tool against integration, had many glaring omissions. Written by Attorney General and avowed segregationist, Bruce Bennett, who often he and Faubus tried to out-segregation e each other in public comments. It did not indicate when the recalled members lost their seats. Was it after the election results were announced, after they were certified, or after the new members were appointed? In addition, the election commission, which was prepared to certify the results, did not know to whom they were issuing the certification. Because it was a citizen-issued recall for a school district race, none of the pre-existing rules applied. And again, the Bennett Bill did not spell it out. The Pulaski County Board of Education, a countywide body tasked with, among other things, filling vacancies on the school boards, had to wait for the results to be certified before they could appoint the new members. Each of these new members would then stand for re-election in December at the next school board election. In the interim, the school board had scheduled a meeting for two days after the election, but with its membership uncertain and no pressing matters, the three retained members, Tucker, Matson, and Lamb, postponed the meeting. In the coming days, the Election Commission would meet and certify the results. They ended up sending them to County Judge Arch Campbell. And you know, for those who knew Arch Campbell or knew of him, he was in control of everything, so that was a safe thing to send. That was the safe thing to do. J. H. Cottrell, B. Frank Mackey, and H. L. Hubbard were appointed to the three spots, although Hubbard resigned four days later, saying he was ineligible to serve. And there are conflicting accounts as to his reason for ineligibility. W.C. McDonald filled the sixth spot, so by the end of June, the Little Rock School Board was finally back up to six members. While there had been no guarantee that the new members appointed would be in favor of reopening the schools, STOP and W.E.C. members were generally pleased by the choices. As the new school board's June 15th meeting, while they still only had five members, Tucker, Matson, and Lamb were elected as president, vice president, and secretary, respectively. Also at that meeting, Superintendent, Superintendent Alford's month-long tenure ended as he was replaced once again by Superintendent Powell. A federal district court ruling on June 18, 1959, which struck down the law allowing the closure of schools, cleared the way for the Little Rock High Schools to reopen, albeit with limited immigration integration. Without the recall effort, this judicial decision would doubtless have resulted in more 3-3 ties about the next steps. The opening date of the school year was moved earlier by several weeks to avoid the chance that the legislature could meet and throw up more roadblocks before the school year began. Even among the supporters of reopening the schools, there was discord about the degree of integration and the speed at which it should be done. There would be much hand-wringing and legal wrangling in the weeks, months, and years to come. Each of the three new members were re-elected in December 1959. Mackey served only one term, leaving in 1962. Lamb and Cottrell ended their service in 1964, while Tucker served on the school board until 1965. The last of the recall veterans, Matson, served until 1966 when he and McDonald exited the school board. Now, eventually the school board, which was finding itself increasingly deadlocked on a variety of issues, added a seventh position in order to avoid ties. The winner for that seventh seat in 1966, T.E. Patterson, Jr., became the first African American to hold elected public office in Little Rock since the 1800s, and he would remain on the school board until 1982. 
The 1960s and early 1970s were filled with much discussion and dissension as integration gradually increased in high schools and expanded to junior highs and elementary schools. With the end of the 1971 school year, all Little Rock schools were no longer segregated. Integration and busing plans became defining issues in the annual school board elections, often with voters approving contradictory of slates, slates of candidates in successive years. And again, this was at a time that the voting was citywide. But on May 25, 1959, those matters were for another day. For that one night in the now vanished Hotel Marion Ballroom, as Mattson, Lamb, and Tucker rode on the shoulders of jubilant young men. The supporters of the fired 44 employees and of those three school board members who defended them were left to savor their victory. If there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer them or make them up. <laughs> 